सेव किया था ना मैं सिर्फ इसलिए गया था क्योंकि उसने मुझे कॉल किया दैट्स इट बट लिसन तो सेव इट फॉर समवन एल्स जिंदगी में सेव करना जरूरी है मगर जब बात पैसों की हो सिर्फ सेविंग से काम नहीं चलेगा इक्विटी म्यूचुअल फंड्स में इन्वेस्ट कीजिए और अपने सेविंग्स को आगे बढ़ने का मौका दीजिए म्यूचुअल फंड इन्वेस्टमेंट्स आर सब्जेक्ट टू मार्केट रिस्क रीड ऑल स्कीम रिलेटेड डॉक्यूमेंट्स केयरफुली देर इज समेट आई थिंक क्वाइट जेन्यनली सो दैट वी डो नॉट टॉक अबाउट द साउथ एनफ द साउथ ऑफ इंडिया एनफ सदर्न स्टेट्स ए फैसिनेटिंग पॉलिटिक्स फैसिनेटिंग कल्चर ब्रिलियंट पीपल एंड रियली वी शुड बी टॉकिंग मोर अबाउट इट और मे बी देर इज लेस ट्रबल इन द साउथ ऑफ इंडिया आई डोंट नो बट दिस इज समथिंग दैट वी हैव टू रेक्टिफाई सो जस्ट एज वी फोकस ऑन कर्नाटका थ्रू इट्स मेट्रोपोलिटन सिटी बेंगलुरु वी आर ऑल्सो फोकसिंग नाउ टूडे on telangana and andhra through their metro city i'm conscious that i'm saying their metro city because now it only belongs to telangana so my friends in telangana will object but the fact is that until a few years back this was this was kind of common capital of this entire region when the state was one and importantly in the context that we are talking today this this belongs to the old full state of what became hyderabad in fact was even bigger than this in the past so this is about the liberation of hyderabad as we know modi government has announced that beginning september 17 september 17 is when the 75th anniversary celebrations of the liberation of hyderabad will begin now they've been saying liberation of hyderabad and they are saying they'll have a big function big rally and they've also decided to call it vijay sankalp sabha so vijay as you know means victory now the two local parties that is kcr's trs and also his partner that is mim led by asaduddin obesi they both also jumped on to the bandwagon but with their own nuances so while the central government the bjp government is saying liberation of hyderabad they are saying integration of hyderabad so once again they are backing in a way they are making at least pretending to be making or seeming to be making an independent demand for a for, for a year long celebration of the integration they call it the integration of hyderabad into india government of india that's modi government is calling it liberation of hyderabad in india so as my colleague an art political editor dk singh points out to me that the fascinating part here is that the debate is between calling it liberation and integration why because integration means something that happened in a way voluntarily peacefully liberation means something that happened by the use of force what was the truth truth as we'll discuss soon enough is a bit of both but the fact is there is a reason why the local parties do not want to call it liberation in fact a few years back when the bjp i think 2017 when they first talked about these celebrations then kcr and his government had thought that it wasn't a very wise thing to do because it might upset communal harmony because what happened in hyderabad between 1947 48 was a very fraught situation with very strong communal not just overtones but very strong communal consequences and bloodshed now what exactly was hyderabad in 1947 48 i just said to you that it, that in fact it, hyderabad the city does not just repre- represent the states of andhra and telangana as we have known it but in fact a much larger geography so before independence this this state the state of hyderabad which was a princely state at that point governed by or ruled by mir usman ali asif jah 7 that is a seventh nizam in 1687 ad aurangzeb laid a siege around golconda and that is when aurangzeb sort of took over this region and declared it the, the dakkan suba or deccan suba because it was next to the deccan region it was that time when then rulers of this region or what became hyderabad region they ceded to aurangzeb so the first local commander who aurangzeb put in charge of the state or of the province or of whatever you might call it of the principality was kamruddin khan kamruddin khan who later came to be known as asif jah 
one. So Asif Jah one and 1947-48, it was Asif Jah seven, the last Nizam. Now the last Nizam, as we know, was among the richest men in the world, probably the richest at that point, because he owned 10% of all the land, 10% of all the land in very large state. And how large was that state? That state which the Nizams had inherited from from 17th century onwards. That state included not just the current boundaries of Telangana and Andhra Pradesh, but also large parts of what is today Karnataka, Maharashtra, some bit of Tamil Nadu, some bit of Madhya Pradesh, etc., etc., etc. So this was then a very large state, a very large state surrounded by today's or touched by today's Madhya Pradesh, Maharashtra, Karnataka, Tamil Nadu, and so on. Again, what was the population mix? The population mix of Hyderabad in 1947 was about 85% plus Hindu and about 15% Muslim. But the ruler was Muslim. The predominant strength of the armed forces, the police, the bureaucracy, the nobles who ran the government or who commanded power for the Nizam were mostly all Muslims. In fact, a lot of them were foreign Muslims. The commander-in-chief of Nizam's army, for example, Major General Syed Ali El Edruz was an Arab. And there were many other Arab soldiers and then Pathans from the frontier, what is, which is now a part of Pakistan, Rohila Pathans and many people, many Muslims from Northern India as well, and including many other officers of foreign origin. So that was the kind of army, he had a sizable army. In fact, he had an army of almost 27,000 people, of which 17,000 were regular soldiers, another eight to 9,000 were then co-opted as volunteers later. And they were quite well armed. In fact, it, it wasn't a Faltu army. They had some strength. They had three armored regiments. In fact, initially they tried to fight Indian tanks as they came in, Indian army's tanks as they came in. Three armored regiments, one horse cavalry, what good it was in 1948, you can figure out, but one horse cavalry. Because you see, what's the point of being a Nizam, a big feudal ruler, a, a Badsha? if you don't have horse ca cavalry to give you your salam as well. So three armored regiments, one horse cavalry, 11 infantry battalions, and one artillery regiment. So that was his strength at that time. Now 1947, as India was being put together, Hyderabad came up with the, with the idea that they did not want to become part of India. They did not, did not want to become a part of India. They did not want to become a part of Pakistan. They wanted to remain independent. And they found a lot of support among the Tories in British Parliament. Tories in British par Parliament who did not like Mountbatten either. So Churchill and his people supported, supported the Nizam's idea that Hyderabad should remain independent. Of course, the cover under which they did so was that any province in India that's been faithful to us, they should be allowed to have their own way or they should be allowed to go with their own will. If anybody tries to change that by force or violence, the British is morally bound to protect them. That is what Churchill and his people said in British Parliament. And that is what gave strength to the Nizam at that point. And the Nizam said that I am not going with India. The Nizam also got a good advisor a legal advisor come top diplomat who was Sir Walter Monckton. Sir Walter Monckton was so well connected. He was a top lawyer, King's Council. He had also advised famously King Edward over his abdication. Now he was he was representing the Nizam and he was going to the Viceroy and others and saying, look, under no circumstances will the Nizam agree to become a part of India. The Nizam wants this wants his sovereignty. Now, can you imagine if this entire region had become a sovereign nation? Once again, India already had lost a large region on its west, a large region on its east, that is West Pakistan and East Pakistan. Was it now going to have a Pakistan in its heart also? That would have made India completely unsustainable. So, so this was not something that would be acceptable to India. Although at that point, Indian armed forces had already got involved in fighting in Kashmir because Pakistan had started it. At that point of time, both India and Pakistan had British generals commanding their armies 
Indian troops were already distracted, fully engaged in Kashmir. So India did not have the ability or time or wherewithal or the breathing space now to take on one more rebellion in a large province that was called Hyderabad. And Hyderabad wasn't just a city, it was a province much larger than today's Telangana and Andhra put together. So India decided to wait it out. It was in November that year, therefore, that Hyderabad and India signed what was called a standstill agreement. A standstill agreement meant that until the period of this agreement, which was a year from then, status quo will continue, which means that the powers that the British government had over these states, those powers will now vest with the Indian government, which means foreign affairs, defense, etc., etc. On other issues, the local ruler will continue to have their powers. So that standstill agreement was signed in November of 1947. But India was pushing now, the new government of India was now pushing for integration of Hyderabad. And they were hoping that this will happen voluntarily through diplomacy. So Sardar Patel appointed a top lawyer again, Kanhaiyalal, Maniklal, Munshi, K. Munshi, who belongs in the role of honor of the great people, great Indians, who became the builders of our modern nation. So K. Munshi was negotiating with the Nizam, basically trying to negotiate an accession, instrument of accession from him, just like the Maharaja of Kashmir. So there will not be a complication and a military will not have to be used. Nizam, on the other hand, had a very shrewd and a very tough negotiator from his side. That was Mir Laik Ali, who was like his prime minister. So Mir Laik Ali was going to accept nothing less this than independence, which was completely unacceptable to K.M. Munshi, Kanhayalal, Maniklal Munshi on India's behalf, on government of India's behalf. Now that went on and on. And meanwhile, while this Tamasha was going on, in Hyderabad, another force rose. And that was the force called Razakars. Now in 1927, a new political, a quasi-political group had been formed in Hyderabad, quasi-political group, entirely Muslim group, completely loyal to the Nizam and also opposed to the idea of integration with India. That was called Majlis-e Ittihad-e Muslimin, MIM. It, its current avatar is All India MIM that Asaduddin Ovesi heads. Now, MIM was there to support the Nizam and to support the idea that Hyderabad should remain independent. Through MIM, another force rose that was a more actively, openly militant force. That was the Razakars. Razakars were led by an Aligarh Muslim University scholar, Qasim Rizvi, who was very radical and who was rapidly radicalizing young Muslims in Hyderabad. And that was leading to a lot of communal trouble, targeting of Hindus. Remember, this is when partition riots are already going on. Hindus and Muslims are at each other's throats. Hindus, Muslims, Sikhs. Terrible things are happening in this subcontinent. And a lot of the Muslims who got left behind, say in Uttar Pradesh or what is today Madhya Pradesh, etc., etc., they thought that since they were under threat from the Hindu majority where they were, if they came to Hyderabad state, although they would still be a minority in Hyderabad state, but they'll be safer because the ruler was a Muslim. So they started coming in and as they started coming in, they started going to Hindu localities, driving the Hindus out. So a bit of the partition mayhem also shifted to Hyderabad, which had consequences later that I'll tell you about in just a minute. It was in this process that the Nizam started collecting weapons for himself. And how did these weapons come? He was buying these weapons from Europe. Now in Europe, many countries at that point had a lot of spare weaponry left behind by the Germans. Germans had just been defeated. So lakhs and lakhs of small arms, lakhs and lakhs of other weapons, ammunition was lying. Countries like France, Belgium, the Netherlands, Sweden, all the winners all the winners of the Second World War, where German soldiers, German armies had surrendered or abandoned their positions, they were left with a lot of weapons. So Pakistani trade commissioners in various places were trying to buy these weapons, take them to Pakistan, and from Pakistan in turn, they were being flown by gun runners, by a famous gun runner of Australian origin called Sydney Cotton. So Sydney Cotton was running the storied flights from Pakistan into Hyderabad, 
bringing these weapons. So at one point, in, if you see the declassified documents of the British Foreign Office, they tell us that the Pakistani Trade Commissioner in Paris put up an order for 6 lakh rifles, 3 lakh automatic weapons, so on and so forth. And also told the French that if you don't sell these to us, these are after all far too German weapons. If you don't sell these to us, we will buy these from other European countries who also have supplies of these or stockpiles of these available. Now, I don't know how many were sold. India also ran very aggressive diplomatic uh, operation across the world to make sure that this was stopped. And yet a lot of weapons got into Hyderabad. So I told you about how MIM had come up and MIM then spawned the Razakar. At the same time, on the other side, on the Indian nationalist side, in 1938, the Congress party had promoted Hyderabad Congress, which was then talking, talking, talking about merger with India, which was then talking about peaceful ideas, etc., etc. And they unfurled the Indian national flag in Hyderabad on August 15, 1947, for which they were jailed and tried. So there was also that tussle going on on the ground. Now the scene shifts to June. So June 1948, June 1948, VP Menon, who's doing all these negotiations with, all these difficult negotiations with the princely rulers on behalf of Sadar Patel, he meets Lai Kali, the Prime Minister of Hyderabad in Delhi. And once again, Lai Kali is not willing to give any ground. June 21, June 21, just as, just as Mountbatten demits office in India and goes back. He, he writes a letter to Nizam of Hyderabad advising him to merge with India and saying, look, it's for you to avoid bloodshed. And if you avoid bloodshed, you will become a statesman. So he thought that if now that Mount Baton is going, going away, I might actually have a better chance of surviving. It didn't quite turn out that way. Now, as this was going on, Nizam's forces then began carrying out raids in adjoining states and that number was rising and I'm sure some of, some of it was also used by Sadar Patel and those on the Indian government side or government of India side, everything was Indian government, government of India side then to say that look, this is this is not this is not something that we will tolerate. If there are more raids like this, we will be forced to use the military and there will be a retaliation and we will come in and take over by force. It was around this time that Nehru also spoke out and Nehru said, if this goes on, we'll have no choice but to use force over Hyderabad. Now, while this was happening, word went out, word was sent out to the Indian Army. Word was sent out to Indian Army now to plan a real operation to take over Hyderabad. And this was now going to be a full-fledged military operation. So this operation was called the Goddard Plan. Goddard, named after Lieutenant General Ian Goddard, who was then the Southern Army Commander for Indian Army. Southern Army Command, as you know, is at Pune. And a lot of Indian Army's heavy units, particularly armor, was based in that region. So this plan basically meant Indian attack coming from two directions. One from Sholapur side in what is today Maharashtra, other from Vijaywada side or Surapet side, which is now Andhra Pradesh. So one set of forces, the larger body of forces, which are coming in from, from Maharashtra, from Sholapur, that was headed by Major General J.N. Chaudhary, who later rose to become Chief of Army Staff. In fact, he was Chief of Army Staff during the 1965 war with Pakistan. So General J.N. Chaudhary came with a lot of armor from the east and other columns came from Surya Pet or Vijaywada side headed by Major General Ajit Rudra. Now this led to a real fire fight. And in fact, there was a concern in Delhi that Indian army might just get distracted or bogged down for a long time. And it could not afford this because there, there was already fighting going on in Kashmir. So General Sir Roy Butcher, who was Commander-in-Chief of Indian Army, at that point objected and he said, don't distract the Indian Army, don't distract my army. Then Indian Army was General Sir Roy Butcher's army. He said, don't distract this army because we are fighting in Kashmir. But India took the call, Sadat Patel and Nehru took the call and these, this army operation was launched. This operation was called Operation Polo. There is plenty about it on the internet. You can read more about it. The fact is that this led to a real fighting, although not for too long. So this was a 109-hour firefight. It began at around 3 a.m. on 13th of September. It was over on the 17th with the surrender of the Nizam and also his commander-in-chief. 
that is General El Edrus. General El Edrus was an Arab. Uh, he surrendered, so he was let go. He later wrote his memoir, and in his memoir, he said that he had already received more than twenty thousand point three not three rifles. So remember, in nineteen forty eight. No self-loading rifles or AK-47s had been invented or M-16s. Point three, not three rifles were the thing, and he writes in his memoirs that he had already received twenty thousand plus point three, not three rifles with Pakistani markings, which means that he had a fair bit of firepower. So his army fought for some time, but quickly folded up and surrendered. As his army surrendered, some comical. and part comical events also played out so we told you about sydney cotton the australian gun runner and pilot who was flying these weapons from pakistan into hyderabad he was still in hyderabad when the surrender took place and he had to he had to run so he decided to escape using a world war 2 bomber from hakimpet airport in the early hours of the 16th 16th of september and in his plane apparently there was also 4 million pounds worth in rupees that must have been a lot of lot of rupees so he was escaping and the comic part was that along with him he was supposed to carry kasim razvi who was the commander of the razakars and who the indian army and indian forces would have been hunted for hindu and more than that hindu mobs would have been hunting for now it seems or at least cotton claimed later that he had presumed that kasim rizvi had come to the airport and already boarded the plane but kasim rizvi had not boarded the plane so there was this tragic comic scene at hakimpet airport of his plane making its take off run and kasim rizvi the big commander of the razakars running behind it in desperation kasim rizvi was taken prisoner he was tried for sedition later in 1957 he was he was allowed to go to pakistan in he in fact he was let off on the condition that he will go to pakistan pakistan is gave us gave him asylum but apparently he died a very poor man a penniless man nearly a beggar in 1970 as he was leaving india he handed over the control or the keys of what was then called mim to abdul wahed wazi who quickly renamed it all india mim to say that this is now a nationalist party this is not a separate separatist party this party does not believe in the independence of hyderabad as a state and that finally became the political party that's been very prominent in hyderabad city since then and asaduddin owaisi is actually his grandson so september 17 1948 it was that nizam surrendered so that is considered the day of liberation of hyderabad he surrendered and then k munshi advised him to go to the radio, local radio station which he did for the first time and he made a speech where he said that he never wanted to wage this war with india he in fact wanted to settle with india but his government or his system had been taken over by people like sydney cotton and sir walter monckton and also he bl- blamed his prime minister and he said these were hitlerite forces you know hitler was in fashion those days world war 2 had just ended so he said that these were hitlerite forces who had taken over and now all soldiers should surrender and there should be peace and that's how peace came and then the question comes what could you do with the nizam so there was some thought that he could be offered an ambassadorship somewhere but then given the way he used to dress he was the richest man in the world but probably the biggest kanjus in the world such a penny pin- pincher he o- he wore old worn out clothes he never offered anybody a cup of tea how could you make a man like him ambassador of india some place so he was given by way of a lollipop the governorship of hyderabad now where do you read a lot of this stuff you read a lot of this stuff about about the nizam and what happened in hyderabad in ram goha's book that is india after gandhi and if you go to page 51 i think the next two or three pages are quite are quite detailed in terms of what hyderabad was at that point and the forces that were at work the fact also is that we must must also mention that after the liberation of hyderabad again rioting took place now muslims were at the receiving end and a lot of muslims were killed and looted and a lot of excesses were carried out that is when jawarlal nehru pandit jawarlal nehru set up a commission of inquiry called the pandit sundarlal commission of inquiry which had a mixed membership from communities that commission of inquiry 
gave a fairly scathing report, which also estimated that about 27,000 to 40,000 Muslims had been killed in massacres. Remember, this was a season of Hindu-Muslim massacres. Now, that is a report that caused a little bit of a sensation and controversy at that point because that also suggested that many troops of Indian Army were also involved in these either through sense of omission or commission. In some cases, that got involved in excesses. In some cases, they let armed Hindus carry out excesses. Not the officers, but troops. Now, Sardar Patel immediately objected to this. He repudiated and rejected this report. He said it was biased. It had taken one view. It had only begun investi investigating this from a particular point in a very fraught history. Now, the founders of modern India were conscious of this. Sadar Patel was not a fool. Sadar Patel was a very shrewd man. So he used his army. He used his armored division for liberating Hyderabad. Indian Army itself suffered nearly 45, 47 killed in this operation, almost 400 wounded. Nizam's armies and Razakars suffered almost 2,000 killed. This was real fighting between armies and yet Sardar Patel did not call it an army operation. He called it a police action. Why did he call it a police action? Because he knew that this is an independent India. The army must have the image of being impartial, non-partisan, all communities, everybody must trust the army. Everybody must trust the army and the army should be kept as far from controversies, particularly controversies related to internal politics or communal politics as possible. And that's the reason he called it police action and which is the reason why now that this one year celebration being unfolded for liberation of Hyderabad, a lot of these old stories will also be reopened and that's the reason I thought it was important for us to learn about this in some detail today.